That was beautiful. Thank you. Gorgeous. Wow. Well, we continue with our stewardship series this year, the balancing act that we've been talking about the last few weeks. I do apologize to our visitors who are here for the first time today. You know, once a year we spend a couple of weeks talking about stewardship, and then one of those Sundays we have the money sermon. This is the money sermon where we talk about giving to the church. And I'd like to begin by reading the scripture, which is at the heart, the theme for our entire stewardship series this year. It comes from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 28. Listen for the word of God. And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. About 12 years ago, when I was 36 years old, my entire life savings, a whopping $35,000, was all sitting in my checking account, earning exactly 0% interest. I knew this wasn't good. I knew I needed to do something about it. And so I started researching. For a year and a half, I read everything I could get my hands on, from the Motley Fool to Jim Cramer's The the Street to Morning Star and Jubax Journal. I took those trial subscriptions to the Wall Street Journal and Investor's Business Daily and Money Magazine. At the time, it was in the middle of that high-tech stock boom (coughs) and all of these high-tech stocks that were just skyrocketing. And all of everywhere that I heard about was talking about the importance of diversifying your portfolio, of making sure that you had a balanced portfolio of investments. And some people were saying that these, this high-tech stock boom was really just a bubble and was going to burst any day. Others were saying, no, 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 this is the new reality, and this was a permanent thing that was happening. And so I I took my time and I I waited patiently and I watched as all of these stocks doubled and then doubled again. And finally, after a year and a half, I decided it was time to get involved. And so I took my entire $35,000 life savings and I put it into a very balanced, very diversified set and portfolio of high-tech stocks. You know, I mean, I, it really was. I mean, I, I was very careful to have kind of both sides of all the spectrums. I had, I had both Lucent and MCI. Some of you know what that means. I had both Texas Instruments and Global Crossing. I had both Cisco and Amgen. Well, this was exactly two weeks to the day before the bubble burst. And in three days, just three days, my $35,000 portfolio, well-balanced portfolio, became a $8,000 well-balanced portfolio. Now the problem was that what I thought was balanced wasn't balanced at all, right? And I feel like the same thing goes on all the time in our world and our society as our society tries to get us to invest our time and our energy and our resources into things that are just elusive. 
It seems like every day another dozen self-proclaimed gurus comes along to tell us how to live the good life and, and what we should be investing our time and our talent and our resources into. And yet it seems that the more we follow the conventional wisdom of this world, the more bankrupt our portfolios become. I mean, it really is a disturbing paradox. Here in the United States, we have the best higher education of anywhere in the world. People spend their whole lives trying to get to our shores so that they can learn what we know. And yet we're doing a worse and worse job at educating our own children. Here in our country, we have a better ability to feed ourselves than anywhere else in the world, bar none. And yet quickly, we're becoming one of the least healthy countries in the entire world. I mean, even after this recession, we still make more money than 99% of this world. And yet, we're spending less and less time with our families and less and less time doing the things that we all know are most important. A couple of years back, there was a, a poll taken that showed that we are becoming one of the least happy countries and content countries in the entire world. That despite our cheaper air travel, although that's not so cheap right now, but um, <laughs> cheaper air travel, microwave ovens, smartphones, flat screen TVs, emails, all of these things that are supposed to be making life easier and more enjoyable, the truth is when the, uh, when the National Opinion Research Council in Chicago did a poll in 1957, 51% of Americans said they were very happy. A couple years ago when they did it again, that was down to 31%. Something is going wrong. Something's going the wrong way. We're beginning to want things that just aren't good for us. And that is at the heart of our scripture today. You know, the entire Sermon on the Mount, sort of like... It's been described as the, owner owner, the owner's manual to the human body. That if we want to know how we work best, how we're, we were created to function and to be content and be satisfied in, the, in this world, that we need to go and read the manufacturer's instructions. And that that's what this Sermon on the Mount is, and particularly this portion of it that we read from this morning. Where he says, don't get too wrapped up in what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink and what you're going to wear. Don't allow yourself to get hijacked by all of these messages that Madison Avenue is spending billions of dollars to try to convince us of. That it's when we pop a, a bottle of Michelob that we're going to finally say, you know, guys, life doesn't get any better than this. It's when we have the right little alligator or whatever it is these days on our shirts or the right emblem on the hood of our car that that's where we're going to find contentment. But what Jesus says is seek ye first the kingdom of God. Chase after God's priorities for your life. Chase after God's agenda for you. And all of this other stuff, it'll just fall into place. You know, there is a way that we were created to handle our money. There is a formula, a very simple formula that we were created to follow when it comes to our finances. It is a formula that has been touted not just by we religious types for thousands of years, but even by secular financial planners because it works. Because it is a sure fire formula to long term fiscal success and security and satisfaction. It's a simple for formula, and it goes like this save 10% of everything you make, give away 10% of everything you make, and then build yourself a life and a lifestyle based on the other 80%. Save 10% of everything you make. 
so that you'll have money for retirement, so that you'll have money for a rainy day if you lose your job or if something, some curveball hits you around the next corner, that you will know that you are safe and secure. Give away 10% of everything that you make so that you will feel content in this life. You will feel like you are here for a reason and a purpose and a meaning. Give away money so that you will feel connected to your community and your city and your world as you are making a difference in people's lives so that you can feel like you are a part of something bigger than yourself. And then finally, build a life and a lifestyle by being a good steward and making wise decisions with the other 80%. I don't know about you, but if I'm going to try to live with the end in mind, like we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, from this deathbed perspective, I want to be able to lie on my deathbed and look back over a well-diversified portfolio of good. I want to know that I spent all of the resources of my life in the best way possible that was going to make a real difference and live on after me. I want to have spent my life in a way that wasn't just about making a living, but actually building a life. And not just a life for me, but a life for others as well. I mean, think about it. If I'm going to earn, what, a couple of million dollars over the course of my lifetime? A staggeringly high amount of money by global standards. I want to know that, sure, yes, that I took care of my family, that I socked away some money for a rainy day, that I even had money to spend on a few luxuries. But I also want to know that I made a real difference while I was here. That people who were hungry were fed because I walked on the face of this planet. That people's lives were literally saved in clinics that I helped to fund and by nurses who I helped to train. I want to know that runaway teenagers on the streets of Hollywood were given a safe place where they were able to grow and thrive before they became drug addicts and prostitutes. I want to know that battered women and their innocent children were given a safe place to land and rebuild their lives and get their second start. I want to know that when the greatest natural disasters that have ever hit this earth in places like Indonesia and Japan and Haiti, on our own shores and places like New Orleans and our Midwest, that when those things happened, that I was part of a response. I was part of people being surrounded and loved, their lives being rebuilt, people knowing that they're not alone when they go through those kinds of things because I was here and because I lived on, in this world. I want to know, I want to be able to lie on my deathbed and picture the faces of the families whose houses I helped to build whether it was down in Mexico through Amor or here in Los Angeles through Habitat for Humanity. I want to know that my life made a difference. I want to know that I was seeking first the kingdom of God. Save 10% of everything you make. Give away 10% of everything you make. And then build a life and a lifestyle by being a good steward with the other 80%. Now, why do I say give away 10%? Well, for a couple of reasons. First, because it's biblical. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, 10% was the standard amount that God expected from God's people. In fact, the word tithe actually literally means a tenth. And throughout the scriptures, this is what God expected from people both in order to build God's kingdom and to help all of the people that God wants to help who, need, who can't help themselves, but also because God understood that it's what we need to be able to give to God, both to make sure that money doesn't overtake our lives and become our idol, that, it's, that we can get materialism and possessions out of the center of our lives, but also because it's what helps us to grow close to God and to learn to trust in God. 
I also say 10%, and they have said 10% for thousands of years, because we know that it is infinitely doable. I want to invite you to think back over all of the different incomes that you have had throughout the arc and the progression of your life. I mean, I know for me that when I think back, you know, at each level, at each level, I always was basically content. I was always basically happy with what I had. And yet I always had a few things that I thought I really needed, a few things that I wanted that it would have been just good to have a little bit more, right? I know that that was the case when I was making half of what I'm making now. And I suspect it would be the exact same thing if tomorrow I started making twice as much. In two weeks, two weeks from today, is Recommitment Sunday. And we are going to be asking you to come with your pledge cards filled out, to come forward and to drop them in the basket together as a community. We hope that you will be able to be there that Sunday and be part of that really important kind of commitment as we do that together as a church. If you're not going to be here that Sunday, we ask that you would fill them out and get them to us before that Sunday. But as we approach two weeks from now, that Sunday, I want to challenge you and ask you to do two things. The first is to just imagine. Imagine in your life, with your unique set of priorities and commitments and obligations that you're already obligated to, if you are not already there, what would it look like? What would it take in your life for you to be giving away 10% of everything that you make, and at least 5% of that or more to the church. What would that look like in your life? What would need to change? What kind of priorities would you need to set? What would need to be done a little bit more of or a little bit less of? What would you need to let go of or to, or to maybe not let go of but just find at a discount? Now, I read about a church recently that the whole congregation for one year decided that they were going to become coupon people. And so even those who just hated the whole idea of coupons, they all committed that they were for a year going to cut the coupons out of the Sunday paper for their groceries. They were going to sign up for scripts so that some of the money went back to the church, look on Groupon and try to find great deals there. If they didn't go to Costco, they were going to sign up for Costco, go when they bought clothes, go to the sales rack and try to find clothes that they liked there, all in an effort to see how much they could save during the year, and then committed to give the church whatever they saved, and to give it for, particularly for their mission budget. And what I understand is that this church didn't just double their mission budget, they doubled the budget of the entire church in that year. What would it take? What would you need to do more of or less of or, or let go of or find at a discount if you were going to give 10% of your income away right off of the top? And if you're not there, but you want to be there, what would a plan look like? How long would it take, five years, 10 years, for you to f- get there? What, what would it take if you were to raise your, your pledge by 1% a year or maybe just a half a percent or a quarter percent until you were where you felt God wanted you to be. So the first thing is I want you to just imagine what that would look like if you were to bring your life into that kind of balance where you were saving 10% and giving away 10% and building your life on 80%. But the other thing I want to ask you to do is to pray. Because I know for all of these great things that we're doing with stewardship, Cynthia's amazing uh, painting and the video you're going to see at the end of the service and all of these things that we're trying to do for this stewardship campaign, nothing will have a fraction of the impact on this campaign as if I can convince you to simply spend some time in the next two weeks, whether it's individually or with your spouse or your partner, praying about what God would have you give as your pledge this year. Because we know that if you receive receive that prompting from God that it is going to be both the right number for you and something that you can live with and God will take care of you with whatever else you have left after that. But also we will know that if the pledge that you give comes to us through prayer that it is the right number for the church as well. 
and that we will do as much ministry during this year as what God has led you to help support. This recession has taken its toll on a lot of us, hasn't it? And we've had people who've lost jobs, people who've lost homes, people who've had to move out of the area. Our budget has been cut as well. We've had to lay off staff, we've had to cut our mission budget, cut money to programs for children and youth and adults. But you know, I know we're not out of the woods yet, but it seems like we've turned a corner. For some, things are just beginning to get better. And I see around this church an incredible energy. It was a great summer, and we've had a wonderful fall so far. Roche and I keep talking about it. We just a lot of people whose lives are being touched and some great programs with uh, Roche focusing on mission these last months. There's just been some great things happening all through the mission of the church and just some real excitement. We're delighted by both Matt Zaro and Christiana Grotlich, our new children's and youth directors, and they have oodles of vision for some wonderful things that they want to do with our kids. And as we begin to rebuild this economy, as we begin to rebuild this enthusiasm for the ministries of this church, I think it's time for us to rebuild our budget as well. You know, I know that there is nothing that could give Yvette and I one-tenth the satisfaction as knowing what our tithe does in this community and around our world. We have hundreds of little kids, little VBS kids, climbing into minivans all over this city and saying, turn on the VBS music, and are singing God's praises because this church puts on such an amazing VBS each year. That we are feeding people around this city, that we are building homes for people. There is nothing that could give us one fraction of the contentment and satisfaction, the sense of connection to you all and to this world is the money we spend on our pledge. I mean, nothing. Not, not a bigger house, not a slightly fancier car, no fancier restaurants or a more expensive bottle of wine or more fashionable clothes would give us even a fraction of what we get through giving our money to this church. Save 10% of everything you make. Give away 10% of everything you make and build a life and a lifestyle on the other 80%. It is a formula for fiscal satisfaction and security and success. But it's also the beginning and the foundation of a formula for a truly balanced life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God God's priorities, God's agenda, what God wants you to have in order to be really content, and everything else, it'll take care of itself. Amen.